I made inquiries into the nature, the likely nature of today's group, and I learned that it could be large and it could be small, and that it would include some people who know the education of Cyrus very well, and would certainly include a number of people who didn't know the education of Cyrus at all. Um, and between those two groups, it included others who might know it a little bit. So under the circumstances, I concluded that it was best if I try something um, expansive so that everyone would get to see the book more or less as a whole. And then in a discussion period, we can take up uh, parts of it that we are most eager to pursue more carefully. So my title is very broad. It's from Republic to Empire to Philosophy question mark. And it tries to capture the breadth of the movement of the book of, as a whole. Uh, the education begins as a description of a republic in just one chapter. Now, after that one chapter, book one, chapter two, we get many retrospective comments that help to fill out the picture of that republic. But it is treated initially briefly in just one chapter. And then in what might total maybe six or six and a half books of the entirety, what we see is how Cyrus transformed this Republic into a vast multi-ethnic cosmopolitan empire ruled by himself. Um, so I wish to follow that development. Uh, what is important about this Persian Republic? And then how does Cyrus transform it into a worldwide empire that he rules? And then finally, the murkier question uh, with a very genuine question mark after it, does the book look toward a life that is unlike the life of Cyrus or not? Does it look to love? Does it look to Socrates? Does it look to Xenophon? Um, where, do, where do we turn after our experience with the education of Cyrus? So that's what I will attempt to do, but I, I also would like to attach a quick prelude um, and make three claims for the book for anyone who may not have spent much time with it yet. Um, and here they are. One, it's tremendously exciting. It's the only work of political philosophy that is also a riveting page turner. Uh, this is a book that uh, has a plot uh, that uh, will keep your attention. You can sit down and plow right through it. And of course, uh, uh, you know, I was completely smitten by Plato's Republic, for example, but I'll confess to you that, you know, sometime well before I hit the nuptial number and the divided line, <laughs> I mean, I needed a break. But this, this is a book that will draw you in with a larger than life hero always or almost always in control of himself and in control of the situations in which he finds himself. Secondly, it's a book that raises a broad array of questions. It is ostensibly a political book. It is a very political book, but it's not a narrowly political book. It's filled with battles and politics, but it also has a couple of love stories and some very engaging characters pleasure-seeking tyrants, a philosopher or two, a band of warriors tougher than the Navy SEALs, some absolute fools, and even an, an army of eunuchs. Um, it also includes military innovations. And I tried to look back and, and see if I could find the source for this, but I just had my memory from maybe two decades ago that there actually was some scholar, I believe he was Scandinavian, who gave credit to Xenophon and the education of Cyrus for pointing out the principles that led to tank warfare in World War II, the Blitzkrieg attack. And you may remember or you, or when you get to book seven of the education of Cyrus, you'll see how Cyrus fortifies chariots and turns them effectively into tanks, much heavier chariots than had ever been used before. And the idea is terrific. I mean, if you want to attack your enemy from the back, if you think about it briefly, you have to have a larger army that will encircle that enemy and enable you to get to the back. But if you have a smaller army, you can do it also if you just break through the enemy lines and then do some U-turns. That's the Blitzkrieg. And that's what uh, Cyrus teaches in uh, book six and seven with his chariots. So that's, this is all part of my effort to persuade you that it's not only an engaging story, but it also has 
a variety of, of subjects in some range. Uh, in short, I, I'm mystified that neither HBO nor Netflix, Netflix has discovered it yet and turned it into um, a great moneymaker. I think it's really well suited for them. But then thirdly, and I don't, I don't know that Netflix would care about this, but it's also profound. It's, it's got fascinating conversations on um, important subjects. How many souls do we have really anyway? One or maybe two. When we experience psychic conflict, is that a division within us? Or is it we that are divided, fully divided into two souls? And it's not just that wealth in a society is distributed or things in a society are distributed unequally, as we learned from the big coat, little coat story at the, almost the very outset of the, of the education. It's a stupid distribution of things that we find in society so that the foolish playboy can inherit a Ferrari and the poor graduate student before COVID had to go to campus events to feed himself on cheese and crackers to get pick up at various lectures. In short, there's a, a, a tremendously uh, uh, unreasonable distribution of the goods of the world. And the education takes that seriously and sees if there's a way to remedy it. And it's a book that begins with a serious thesis. Political science is possible. You can learn how to rule and how to acquire political power if only you study Xenophon Cyrus and imitate him. That's the opening claim, book one, chapter one. And it's a fascinating claim, um, and a, a bolder claim than most political science departments would make, I think. Now, I, I confess, I think Xenophon backs away from that claim in the very next chapter, but it's still a wonderful thesis and important to bear in mind, and I think the book can help us understand it. Okay, so that's my prelude. So first chapter, um, so first to return to, to Persia and then the way that Cyrus turns Persia into a vast empire. Persia is obviously meant to represent, this is, we can call this a historical novel, but I, I would add that it's a, a not very historical, historical novel. So that Persia is not really Persia, it's, I don't know, Sparta or the ancient Roman Republic. It's a classical Republic ruled by a group, not by a king or an individual, fanatically devoted to what they call virtue, justice understood as devotion to the common good and obedience to law, moderation, continence, obedience, gratitude, military skills, and tremendously dedicated to these qualities. And the young are taken out of their families and educated in these qualities so that they dedicate themselves, they can dedicate themselves to the common good. They can lift themselves out of the typical selfishness that we're also familiar with. So they're molded to become citizens and not individuals, roughly like ancient Sparta or the Roman Republic. And this is hard for us to appreciate today, I think, but most of us have probably once or twice had thoughts that with all of the liberty that we enjoy, sadly, we don't always use it especially well. And if you ever have that kind of thought, you might begin to be open to the alternative of the Persian Republic, which uh, wants, wants to make sure that you devote yourself to what is most important. And of course, Rousseau took this kind of Republic seriously in the first discourse in book one in the Emile also. So that's Persia. Then the rest of the book, Cyrus transforms Persia into a huge multinational empire. So I ask myself, how? And here's my effort to summarize this. Uh, obviously, uh, it's better to read the, you know, the eight books of Xenophon's book, but uh, my summary is that there are three main steps plus several general requirements or principles that run throughout it. Step one, Cyrus has got to revolutionize the Persian army and he does it. So revolutionize it in what way? Revolutionizes it in four ways. One, he makes it more aggressive, that is less content with defense. I'm gonna build an empire with this army. You can't have them just wanna protect themselves against neighbors. They need a motive to go after somebody. Two, he needs to make it more potent. It's too small to conquer the world, so he needs to make it stronger. Three, he needs to change the focus of its obedience to himself, not old Persia, but to Cyrus himself. Make it loyal to him. And four, 
he needs to make it more self-sufficient so that it doesn't always have to depend on allies for everything. That's the easiest point. He needs cavalry. So if you look at 4-3 and 4-6, you'll see two speeches, one to the allies, uh, one to the Persians and one to the allies. They both make the case, we need horses. Obviously, he puts it a little bit differently to the two different groups. With regard to the first transformation of the army, how to make it more aggressive, he does this in the famous speech um, in book one, chapter five, by liberating acquisitiveness, uh, by teaching that virtue is not its own reward. To put it crudely, <laughs> um, which I'll do a lot of today because I'm trying to move fast, it's stupid to go weed a garden if you never plant any flowers or vegetables, to go work in the hot sun if you don't get some reward. That's the same in Cyrus's presentation. This is an example he uses from his speech in 1.5. As practicing moderation, continence, obedience, if you don't get anything for it, what's the point? So he revolutionizes the army so that they come to believe the point of all of their practices is to get rewarded for it. He changed, he, it's a thought revolution at first. I'm sure it doesn't sink in immediately and it'll take some time. But the point is this, we're not fighting to defend Persia. We're going to be fighting to get our due, to see that our virtue is rewarded. And then I would just say, you know, quickly that when you change the motive for virtue, you also are likely to change its content. Um, so that once you <laughs> decide that the goal is to be rewarded, you look at the rewards and say, all right, well, we'll give me the rewards. And you may find out that some qualities are not likely to be rewarded. So drop them from the category V for virtue and others are, so you add them. So you might follow the career of the virtue of obedience, for example, which is a virtue in Persia, but it becomes much more important, I would say, in, in Cyrus's regime. Or you might think of what Cyrus says in book six, chapter one, when he says, seizing the advantage, and seizing the advantage, that's kind of a rough word in Greek, pleonexia, greedily seizing the advantage in war is safety, justice, and happiness all at the same time. That becomes almost like a virtue because um, it pays uh, in wartime, that's what you want to do. So that's more aggressive, more potent. How do you make the army more potent? You do it by changing the way in which the majority of Persian soldiers fights. Um, as we learn only at the very end of the discussion of Persia, at the end of book one, chapter two, Persia is an oligarchy and it is, it is run by a relatively small fraction of the total population. And they are able to hold the majority in thrall because of their mode of fighting, which is in breastplate, shield, sword, the weapons of close conduct. Whereas the others are not trained in that particular warfare and they don't have the arms. So it's an oligarchy based on a superior mode of fighting. What Cyrus does, the minute he gets his foot out of, out of Persia, he's just crossed the border. He says, okay, we gotta get shields, arms, greaves, helmets for these 30,000 Persian commoners that I brought along with us. Um, and that is going to add, he calculates, tremendous potency to the army. It also constitutes a major revolution for the Persian homeland. Those men cannot go home again because they're from the lower class. Now they've got the arms of the upper class it's a huge fraction of the total. It's 30,000 troops out of a total population of 120,000 um, in Persia. So he has just made it impossible to go home. He's not only made the army stronger, he's changed the political competition, uh, composition. Another way to increase the potency is to decide this. We will reward soldiers by merit, not by giving everybody the same pay. So you fight harder, you do things that we need more, you get more. And that will also encourage fighters to fight harder and that will help the army to win. And then this is uh, at my third list of revolutionary changes to the army. 
you let Cyrus decide what merit is and who is rewarded for it. So this is shifting the obedience of the army from its devotion to the old Persian homeland to Cyrus. It's a huge promotion for Cyrus. Um, and so Cyrus, we're fighting for money and Cyrus is paying our salaries. This is, this is huge. Um, it, it appears to me, I'd like to go back and reread it to make sure I didn't miss something, that it appears to me that it's just for Aulus, a commoner, who makes this point in a speech, which is very nice for Cyrus if he doesn't have to come forward and say, I, Cyrus, I'm going to be making this decision, but to have somebody else say, this is a great decision because Cyrus will be making it. Okay. So how can Cyrus pass these reforms so readily? Well, there's an Assyrian threat. The threat, the Assyrians have threatened to invade the Persians along with their allies. The Medes need to defend with themselves. Um, so we need defensive measures, but defensive measures have offensive implications. So Cyrus can defend these measures as being made for defensive purposes but they do have offensive implications. Or I might say, these are measures that look defensive that Cyrus introduces because they are offensive. They're directed against his own country, Persia and Medea, as much as they're directed against Assyria. Um, that's one reason he can, he can do this because they need to defend themselves. And then a second reason is that the reforms are linked to defects in the Persian regimes. That is, there is a narrow class basis in the old Persian regime. The underclass doesn't like that. And that puts them in a position where they have a good reason to embrace some of these reforms. Um, and secondly, there's no education in the old Persia about why it's good to be virtuous. They just beat people when they're not. They don't explain what's so important about having these good qualities. So when Cyrus comes along and says, by the way, it's really stupid to work so hard to cultivate a virtue if you don't get anything for it. They have nothing to say in response because they have not been trained in that particular fashion. Okay, um, so those are the main reforms that Cyrus undertakes. And I think if you think about, well, historical example, what did Caesar do to make his army so potent and how did he attach it to himself? enabling him to overthrow the Roman Republic, you'll find that there's some overlap. So that was step one. Step two, steal an army. And the army that Cyrus steals is the army, the bigger army, of his, his dear uncle Cyaxares, who is the leader of the, his allied, the allied forces, the Medes. And Cyrus figures out that he'll be much more powerful if he steals that army from his uncle. Um, he's already called his uncle pretty much a jerk to his father way back in book one, chapter six, and a wonderful line from Cyrus says, you know, look, I'm better than all of the rulers out in the world. Look at my uncle, look at my grandfather. That's terrific. Anyway, so this, I, I, this, would, be, this is, would be worth going through carefully, but um, I want to go through it quickly. I can't leave it aside altogether because I like it too much. He does, this theft occurs in my, by my count in five stages. Each stage is very sensitive, delicate, and wonderful, complicated. I'll race through them. Step one, get permission to borrow a few troops. Oh, uncle, couldn't I just borrow a few troops? This is the, they won a big victory at the, the very end of chapter of book three, the very end of book three, they win their first big victory. Um, and the uncle, given his nature, is already half drunk and partying hard. I mean, an hour ago, he was scared. He thought he might be die in a major political military loss. Now the troops are, the enemy's running away. He's in a great position. So the party has started. Then his nephew comes along and says, I really want to pursue the fleeing enemy. Let's go after him. Let's get them. And the uncle sighs there, he says, oh, geez, the party has just started, I don't know. And, and then actually gives him some good reasons not to do it. It's really, he, it's, it's terrific because you've got the very self-indulgent Saeb Zaris, who's this pleasure-seeking despot, 
making arguments about how Cyrus needs to be more self-controlled and continent and not go after the enemy every time he can, not seek every victory, be more restrained. Anyway, Cyaxares wins the argument, but Cyrus gets what he wants anyway, because he effectively rebuts the very last point that Cyaxares makes. Cyaxares says, geez, I don't want to bother my men. You know, they're in a party. It would be kind of rude for me to ask them to do some more fighting. Cyrus says, that's okay. I'll do that. I'll just take a few. And so he, so Cyaxares gives him that opportunity. Then, of course, Cyrus, the next thing he does is steal, get the whole army to follow him. Step one, borrow a few. Step two, borrow the whole army. And that also he achieves in a wonderful way with the help of a great spokesman named Artabasis that we meet on many occasions, who either because he's been told or I think more likely is just so astute that he knows what Cyrus wants. So he serves Cyrus in the way that is most useful to him. Then step three, once you've got the army, you're, it's a cavalry. They're racing all over the, you know, the fields and they're collecting all kinds of loot and killing the fleeing enemy. The, everything's going their way. It's terrific. But the old, their old king, Cyaxares, is back drunk in a tent. And so when he's got this whole army away and a little bit of distance, the next step is to woo that army and make sure the army wants to stay with them and that they don't want to go back with the king. Um, and so this is what happens in book four, chapter two in, in that area. And you can imagine that that wooing entails giving them a lot of good things, material possessions. Then step four, needless to say, Cyaxares is going to wake up the next morning with a terrible hang hangover and wonder where his army is. So he writes a very nasty letter saying to his army, you know, get your buns back here and fast um, and criticizing Cyrus as well. So what Cyrus needs to do at that point is intervene. I mean, you know, if he were just a Machiavellian in the typical crude sense, he would say, that was Cyaxares ordering you to go back, but we're not going to obey that guy, and I'm in charge now. But Cyrus doesn't do that. He says, oh, that's, that's Cyaxares. He seems to be angry at us, but it's really not that. He's just worried that there's some danger here, and he's worried about our health and safety. So um, he'll get over this and not to worry about it. So Cyrus reinterprets the anger of Cyaxares so that the army doesn't feel that they have to go back. And then in his letter to Cyaxares, of course, there's a little bit of the mailed fist as well as the velvet glove in which he says, um, here's just a little tip from me, Uncle Cyaxares. He said some, you know, some nice things to his uncle too, saying, look, I've done you great favors and here you are being nasty to me. How do you think I feel about that? But then at a certain point, he says something like, well, you know, I'd advise you, Uncle, not to threaten your whole army um, at the same time that they're not in your control and in your obedience, they might be inclined to do you some harm. So there's, there's, a, there's a male fist as well. And then the final step in book five, chapter five, is to secure some legitimacy for the theft so that it's not just theft. It, it looks kind of okay. And this is the wonderful scene, if you've read it, where he sits Cyaxares down under the date palms and they just cry a little bit together and talk about old times and patch things up. And by the time it's over, for reasons that are a little bit hard to figure out, um, Cyrus gets the uncle to consent to this new, new situation, which means he's no longer the ruler of his army. And Cyaxares, well, and I say, I, I haven't quite figured it out. That's completely true. But part of it is force. This conversation takes place in a setting in which it's clear, even to a booby like Cyaxares, that he knows he is heavily outgunned. Cyrus is there with all of his army around this little tent where the conversation takes place. And the Medes themselves, Cyrus's own troops, are drawn up in order by Cyrus, not by Cyaxares. So, I think Cyaxares knows if he's, that if he said, oh, Cyrus, there's one thing I want, my army back. I think he knows that he wouldn't get an affirmative response to that question. So, so force has something to do with it. Uh, Cyrus's father, by the way, had a wonderful comment to him. Um, if you ever study rhetoric, Cyrus is wondering about how to speak and give good speeches. And the father says, 
you know, you'll never find your words as readily obeyed as when you at that same time have the power to do either great ill or great good to the people you're speaking to. So uh, a key to a su successful rhetoric can also be having a powerful army. And Cyrus has that in 5.5 five when he talks to his uncle. Step three, um, step three is to add allies to his force. And I mean, the obvious reason for adding allies is that you make your force stronger. Another added reason for allies adding allies is if you can take them from the enemy, you make his force weaker. So if you can get some people to defect. Beyond that, there's this wonderful change that if you have allies that are closer to the enemy or have been deeply aggrieved by the enemy, is that right? If you have suffered greatly at the enemy's hand, you get new motives to fight and motives that carry you further. So the original goal of putting the army together was just defense, stop the Assyrians. That's all Persia wanted, that's all Medea wanted. But by adding these new allies, the Hyrcanians, Gobrius, Gadatus, Abradatus, Cyrus also transforms the motive for fighting and these allies need total surrender. They need the total defeat of the uh, Assyrian alliance. Be why? Because um, they hate and are hated by the Assyrian king. It's not just political competition. There's personal grudges. There's the deep desire for vengeance. And also because there's been a def defection, the Hyrcanians defect from Assyria. Assyria wants to punish them in a way that they don't need to punish Persia. Roughly, the, you know, the Hyrcanians are to the Assyrian, the, the way Poland was to the Soviet Union. They need, they would have liked a more complete defeat of the Soviet Union than the America that wanted to bring the boys home actually needed at that point. So here's a, just a related but minor nasty detail, I think, is that Cyrus occasionally will remind these allies, I think they're smart enough to know it, but he will occasionally remind these allies that they're in it up to their necks. And if they don't, if, if they don't win <laughs> or if Cyrus leaves them, they are dead meat. So to the Hyrcanium, he says directly in 4523, they are more hostile to you than they are to me. And then this terrible moment in 6 1, 2 to 3, he actually jokes with this poor man, Gadatus, who's scared to death that Cyrus is going to abandon the campaign and go back safely to Persia because he's, his whole life is invested in this. And Cyrus sort of jokingly accuses Gadatus of wanting to disband the army. And Gadatus says, oh, no, 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 that's not it. Um, he's completely terrified. And Cyrus laughs rather cruelly at this man's vulnerability. Gadatus says, if you go away, I'm done for. OK, a key to wooing. So part of this whole strategy is to wooing all of these troops to his side. And a key to this wooing is money. or goods that have a monetary value. And of course, Machiavelli in his Prince chapter 16 speaks of this when speaking of money, you have to be very careful with it. You know, generosity uses up precious, precious resources. So don't be a big giver because, you know, if you, you'll exhaust your treasury. Um, and it's a very sensible lesson, um, which I've tried to practice to the extent possible in my home economics. But he then comes up with a you know, a very Machiavelli comes up with an important modification in which he says, of that which does not belong to you or to your subjects, you can be a very great giver, as were Cyrus, Caesar, and Alexander. For spending of what does not belong to you does not take away your reputation, but adds to it. It is only spending of what is your own that hurts you. <laughs> so it's just this wonderful description of what Cyrus is doing. So this, these are the main steps in Cyrus's rise to power. Um, but I, as I mentioned, I think there are also other things that I put under the heading, not of steps, but of techniques and requirements. And I would like to just mention a couple of these. We don't have time for all of them, but obviously he's got to win four major battles, one in book three and three in book seven. 
And so military tactics, strategy, and all of that comes into play. It is interesting to me that the way that he is able to win or the reasons that he wins, they vary in these different battles and they seem to change a little bit over time. So in the first battle, the um, Persian infantry was tremendously important, for example, but in the battle in Babylon at the end of book seven, there's no mention of the Persians at all. So some things seem to have changed. And um, in the third battle, the one when Croesus is leading the opposition, there's a great emphasis on treachery and technology. So how what this means and how this changes, I think is, is important and interesting. It's at least possible that for, just to mention one point that the, um, declining quality of the Persian army might require, if it were declining, I haven't proved that, but if it were, that it might require a tough technological supplement. You need something, if you lose, if you lose courage, you might need more towers, chariots, fortified things in order to do what you had been doing before. Um, another technique uh, of Cyrus is to appeal in his speeches to noble principles and to do so loudly but then to appeal also to self-interest of those he's speaking to, but to do so quietly, um, often quietly. So here's an example. In the first battle, the last chapter of book three, he speaks to the Persian rear guard because there's a guard in the back of good fighters, heavily armed, and their job is to make sure that the people fighting in front don't turn around and run away. Uh, so that's the rear guard. And Cyrus speaks to them. You are peers, that is Persian upper class, if that's flattery or point of pride. You're more prudent. Your, your position is honored. You, it's your job to oversee and encourage the good. All this is very nice. And then he says after that, but the advantage of victory for you is very important because you're old guys, you don't run as fast and you're in heavy armor. So you can't run, and run as fast. Implied message, if you don't force the people in front of you to fight, you're dead meat. They've got to do that out of their own basic interest. And Cyrus reminds them of that, but typically he puts the nice points first and leaves the sort of threatening message until what comes later. Or, since I quoted Machiavelli on chapter 16, partly because I wonder whether Cyrus doesn't out Machiavelli Machiavelli on this kind of point, in that he creates an, a kind of atmosphere of beneficence that masks his calculation. Um, Machiavelli says, if you're a prince on the march and you've got your hands on somebody else's money, you need to spend it on your troops. Cyrus also seems to be thinking, that's true, but I also want to do it in the nicest way possible so that they think I don't even care about money. Um, he, and this, he, I think it's actually quite wonderful when Cyrus speaks to the allies. These are cavalry troops have gone out and they've collected a whole lot of booty. The, you know, the camp is loaded with wealth and because they've just been so successful and he goes to the allies they've only met you know 12 hours ago so it's not like they've known that one another forever cyrus speaks to them and, and says all right it's impossible for it's important for us to distribute the various tasks here's a billion dollars in gold bullion you keep it safe and the you know the allies are saying what <laughs> you're going to trust us with all of this loot and cyrus says well of course i trust you I mean, we can't do everything. We need fidelity in this place. Of course we trust you. And then, but what Cyrus had said to, to his own troops, the Persians, just a little bit earlier was this, I quote, guys, there's a lot of money in the camp and I know we can take as much of it as we want, but it does not seem to me to be as great a gain to take it than by appearing to be just, to try to make the allies delight in it delight in us even more. Then he says, we should even allow them be, to be responsible for divvying it up, for distributing it. And if they give us less, that's our gain, for this will make them happier to stay with us. 
seizing the advantage now would provide us with wealth that is short lived. But letting this moment go and acquiring the source from, all, from which all wealth naturally springs, this will provide us with ageless riches. <laughs> this, is, this is the guy who trusts the allies to, to treat the money fairly. He's, it's completely calculated it's, and, and wonderfully executed, I think. Um, he even pretends that the Persians don't care much about money. And, you know, for food, oh, a little bread and water. And if you have any leftover water, Chris, that'll be fine. Here, you have these meats and these wines and all of that. But, oh, we don't need this. And for another conversation on money, just to kind of clinch the deal, I won't take you there, but if you're interested or you may remember, well, you will remember it if you've ever read it, is, is the conversation he has with Croesus in Book 8, Chapter 2, where, among other things, he proves that he owns everything in the world. Not that it's all in his basement, but that if he asks for it, there's no one who's bold enough not to give it to him. <laughs> and and then, he, then he says, Croesus, Let's face it, I'm insatiable for money. <laughs> so, so he has this wonderful posture of being above it all. Um, his aura of, his atmosphere or aura of, of beneficence is not limited to money matters. Other things that look noble, he's prepared to have that noble reputation attached to him. So after he rescues this poor man, Gadatus, who's been severely mistreated by the Assyrian king, and Gadatus is revolted from the Assyrian king to join with Cyrus, even though you know, he may not have had the forces necessary to effectuate that revolt successfully on his own, but he so hates the Syrian king that he decided to go for it anyway. Um, and then he gets himself in a jam and Cyrus comes to the rescue like the, you know, the cavalry in the old days. And Gadatus, his life is saved, and he's so filled with gratitude, and he says, by the God, Cyrus, you don't need, you don't need anything from me, and nor did you promise me anything, nor have I done any good for you, but you helped me so enthusiastically that I have been saved thanks to you. I mean, it's just wonderful expression of gratitude. Cyrus accepts this expression of gratitude, and then in a noble way extends it to the whole army. It's even more amazing, Gadatus, that not only I, but the whole Persian force has this attitude toward you. Toward you. Wow, what a noble group of people. But Gadatus is all wrong because Cyrus has already said in 5332 to the troops, he needs to use the, the army to go save Gadatus. So what does he tell the troops? He says, I know you don't wanna do this right now. We've been fighting like crazy, you're all tired, you need food. It's going to be hard, but I think we really should do this because it will seem noble and it'll be just to Gadatus, but it will also be advantageous to ourselves. By actions like this, no one will wish to be our enemy and many will wish to be our friends. So the rescue of Gadatus was a huge help to Cyrus, not an unselfish accident, but he's prepared to allow Gadatus to, to say that it was an unselfish action and not correct him. So Cyrus sometimes extends this atmosphere of nobility to the whole army, as he did in the passage I just mentioned. He also does this with Gobrius in Book 5, Chapter 2, saying, you know, all my troops are just as noble as, you, as I am. <laughs> but sometimes Cyrus is content to um, keep this reputation all for himself. So this, I love this scene where the, the cavalry's out there conquering the enemy, collecting the whole countryside, and they bring in all of these captives from the countryside, come streaming into the camp, these poor refugees, and they're scared to death. They figure that they've got a good chance that they're just going to have their heads chopped off. And so Cyrus persuades the army, look, um, in, in the, an inhabited country is a very valuable possession. Let's let these people go so they work the soil and then we get the profits. The, RV, the army says, all right. And Cyrus says goodbye to the army. Then he goes over to the captives. And who do you think 
tells the captives that they're going to let them free <laughs> and let them go and deliver this, deliver this wonderfully welcome news. We're not going to kill you. We're going to turn you through. Well, Cyrus is happy to do that job himself. And what is the result? The captives get down and they prostrate themselves before Cyrus. I, I translate the Greek word as prostrate. I wish I had had the guts to translate it as do the doggy bow or do the doggy cringe or something like that, because the Greek word has an etymology of you know, the little dogs like this. So Cyrus gets all of this praise for what he's just done. And a final example, which I just mentioned, um, is the saddest example of Cyrus taking advantage of a mistaken appearance. And that's the case of Abraditus and Panthea, a beautiful pair of lovers who think they owe Cyrus a huge favor. And because of that thought, they end up nobly losing their lives. Even though Cyrus has never done anything except try to figure out how they would be most useful to him. So I mentioned two, three steps for acquiring empire, then a few things that he does besides that. Oh dear, I, my time is almost up actually, so I'm gonna race. Um, but he also um, needs to rule the empire, not just to acquire it. And so we see in book, the, the end of book seven, book seven, chapter five, and the first four chapters of book eight, the transformation of the policies needed to acquire into the policies that are needed to rule. Cyrus says, it's a great work to gain an empire, but it is an even much greater work to keep one safe after taking it. Daring may suffice to take, but moderation, continence, and care are needed to hold. It's interesting in that list, he doesn't mention justice is necessary. So I'll just say very rapidly and generally, my impression is that these policies at the end of book seven and the beginning of book eight are, are especially distasteful and disturbing. Um, Cyrus, while acquiring power, Cyrus has managed to maintain the appearance of, um, of being a noble guy. I mean, I've tried to show you that I don't think he is, but I think he has that appearance. And he has managed to be loved by Gobrius and Gadatus and be the object of their gratitude. Now it seems that what he expects, now that he has everything put together, is to be hated. And in order to respond to that, he has to take precautions, and he does. Um, I hope this isn't too crude, but my general thought is that he's raised tremendous hopes to build this empire, but the result is going to be darker and he can't satisfy these hopes. And then he has to clamp down. So just rapidly, a few quick passages at 7558, he says he was prepared to dwell in Babylon in the biggest city and one as hostile to him as any city could possibly be. That's a strong statement. He has frequently said that one of the keys to rule is to be better the, than the subjects. Now he says that again, but he also says he needs to bewitch the subjects. And so this leads him to do some strange things like put on high heel shoes and wear fancy robes. These are completely un-Persian things. The Persians are known for their sweat. And then he's, now he's putting on cosmetics and fancy shoes. You might be able to justify this on the grounds, I, I don't think I can, but you might be able to try to justify this on the grounds that this is his treatment of the broad mass of people. And he has an inner circle that fares better. But what's especially distasteful to me is that the inner circle also does the cringing doggy bow to Cyrus now, everybody. No Persians had ever done the cringing, the cringing doggy bow before. They were a republic. And now they too, um, I think it's in, in chapter three of book eight, they bow down to Cyrus like this. Cyrus fears them all. And so even at his dinner parties, he's careful about who he has sitting to the left of him. 
which is the ideal spot if you care to assassinate somebody. He ranks the, their seating order. You want to go to dinner with Cyrus? I mean, one of the great exciting things might be, well, what number are you going to get for this party? <laughs> because he's constantly changing the seating order depending on who has you know, behaved most in the way that he wants them to. And um, in, in the beginning of, well, no, let's see, 8143 to 48, roughly in that area, he, he describes, Xenophon describes how Cyrus tried to make himself, let's say, hated less than anybody else among his inner circle. <laughs> I mean, before the emphasis is something on this, I want to be loved, I'm going to do great things so that I can be loved. I know there's still a grain of that, I, I, or something of that, I don't want to exaggerate. But I think the emphasis is a little bit more, make them hate one another more than they hate me. It kind of reminds me of the Assyrian king who was known for his envy. So if somebody was more attractive, better, a better hunter than he, he killed them. So he wanted to be the best of everybody. And the way he got there was by killing anyone who was better. I mean, that was this sort of crude characterization of his policy. And now Cyrus, he's trying to sow discord among his best friends so that they're less likely to collaborate with one another against him. Um, a wonderful way he does this is if they have disagreement with one another, he says, all right, each of you choose somebody, uh, you agree on who's going to decide your case, who's gonna be the judge? So then there's a third one involved. So they argue it out, the third one judges, person A wins. Person A will feel, no fear, will feel no gratitude to the judge because he will just think, I won and I deserved to win. I was completely right. It was ridiculous what that other person was saying. The person who loses will hate both the person that he lost to and the judge. So Cyrus sows discord by method like this. He also has a bodyguard of eunuchs. That seems a little distasteful. 10,000 Persian commoners. My conclusion is it does not end. The book as a whole does not end so well for either ruler or ruled. It's hard to think that one would read the book carefully and conclude, boy, I wish I lived then and there and had that Cyrus as my leading monarch in Babylon. And it it's also hard, I think, to read the book and think, boy, I wish I were like Cyrus, who had a bodyguard of eunuchs and not a single friend he could trust. <laughs> this too seems a little difficult. So that's the last part of my title. And the big question mark is, where does the book point? And I, I mean, my, as I said before, the question mark is completely sincere and honest. If Cyrus is the answer, and if the question that is asked is the right question, back to book one, chapter one, then the book doesn't point beyond itself. It just says, well, reread the book and learn to do what Cyrus did. There's the answer. Knowledge can teach you the science of rule. There is a political science. Study Cyrus and try to imitate him. But if the education shows that Cyrus is flawed, and that his empire is flawed, maybe the book points in some other direction. It could point back to Persia and the rule of law. I mean, a, a, a very silly thought on the big coat, little big boy, little coat story is that, you know, maybe it's not so important that Persian law, not so stupid that Persian law said, the big boy gets the little coat, the little boy gets the big coat. And that's, that's how you determine ownership, the law. You don't ask what's fitting, you ask the law. Maybe that's not so stupid because the two boys could have then just exchanged coats and all, all would have been well. I mean, on their own, that would have been no violation of the law. Why do you need to transform everything? Now that's a silly and simple case, but going back to Persia is one alternative and maybe Cyrus's father thought that that was the best possible alternative. Very impressive man, as you can see in book one, chapter six. He did not seem to share Cyrus's ambitions. Second alternative, a private life of love. I mean, you've got two loving couples in this that are attractive, Pantheon Abratitus and Tigranes and his wife. It is true that one of these couples makes a big mistake. Um, if, if it's possible for them to have been as beautiful a couple without having made that mistake, maybe they're a kind of model. Um, 
And then another possibility would be a more devoted pursuit of the theoretical questions that are raised in the book that are not answered by Cyrus or not even pursued carefully by him. Cyrus raises, I think, only two questions not directly related to his career. I mean, his, his passion. Um, and they both regard a, a Socrates or a Socratic presence. One is to Tigranes about the wise man with whom he used to study. And one is to Croesus about the Oracle of Delphi. And Croesus is a kind of Socratic type stand-in. Obviously, there are differences. But like Socrates, he was deeply interested in the Oracle of Delphi. And he tested it. He didn't even accept it up until the end. He said, you, Cyrus, are the one that's going to be able to see whether this is true or false. So he, Cyrus is actually elevated above the Oracle of Delphi and Croesus's understanding. And then there are other big and engaging questions that come up and along the way, that they come up with Cambyses, his father in 1-6, and with Erastus about love in uh, book five and, and then again in book six. So in contrast with Plato, there's certainly, as, as far as I see it, there's no breathless protreptic to philosophy. You know, in Plato, you, you sometimes get these wonderful sections that buzz you and uh, persuade you that you, you've got to turn immediately to the life of philosophy or you'll be miserable your whole life. And I don't, I don't quite see that here. Um, on the other hand, Cyrus is no hero. There are modest nods to wise men. And there are profound questions that Cyrus doesn't pursue and that leave us, I think, interested. Is love voluntary? What is a voluntary action? What are its requirements? Is moderation a learning or a passion? So Socrates, Plato Socrates also went out of his way to see conversa to seek conversation with the ambitious young. And this ambitious young must also be part of the audience of the education of Xenophon's education of Cyrus. So I wonder whether Xenophon has a quieter and less insistent protreptic to show the ambitious young that I, Xenophon, know what you want. That is how to acquire power and rule and to establish himself then as an authority in their, in their eyes and then put himself in an excellent position to help them learn whether they really should want to rule in the first place. So thank you. I hope this has been helpful to someone out there. Um, and I also hope you have a, a question, objection, or some other such thing. If you don't, I'm sure I can find a question or two to ask you.